Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Arwain aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lintamande. Thread 4, Project Lawful and Their Oblivious Boyfriend, Episode 74. Keltham gives those words some time to settle. He's kind of guessing that nobody in Galarian has ever before considered the notion of incentive conditions under which talking becomes communication. So now, of course, we have the problem of finding any scoring rule which has this lovely and desirable property. Well, and we'd also like it to have the property that, when something happens, the higher the number you assign to it, the higher your score. Or, when it doesn't happen, lower numbers get higher scores. So long as we're making up a wish list, we'd like the method to still work if somebody says 17.3 out of 100. We can take advantage of a symmetry, which is that if something happens 47 out of 100 times, that means it doesn't happen 53 out of 100 times. So the yes score of 47 should equal the no score of 53. Or to put it another way, the no score of 30 is just the yes score of 70. We don't need separate yes score and no score rules. And somebody named an important final condition earlier. Does anybody happen to remember it? If a prediction breaks down into two separate parts, the points you get for the whole prediction being right should be the points you get for both parts being right, says Gregoria, who said it originally. Um, HM, what sort of scoring rule could have that property? Wizards aren't trained in this math at all. They blink at it frustratedly. If you literally do not need to know about logarithms to be a wizard, and gods can't tell Galarian about math on the order of the conjunction rule of probability, that substantially increases the chance that, in fact, the trick to synthesize your own spells is something on the order of invert a matrix so you can solve for start state given end state. Regardless, he can work with this. If you can't solve the very abstract problem, make up a very specific problem, and consider what the scoring rule would have to look like for that, Keltham suggests. Wizards aren't trained in this math at all, but she's a lot smarter now, and pure math is one of the things headbands are really good for. Gregoria's condition is trickier than it looks, because what they want is for the scoring rule if it would award you five points for a guess, A and five points for a guess, B to award you ten points, if A and B are both true. But the chance of A and B both being true is their individual chances multiplied together, like how two coin flips is one quarter. There isn't anything that has that property. Correction. There isn't anything she previously knew about that had that property. What could you possibly do to numbers? I think we need to invent a really weird thing to do with numbers to satisfy Gregoria's property, she says. I'm imagining, uh defining some property of numbers that scales up a steady amount when they grow by multiplication. Okay, not bad. You usually have to prompt a Dathilani five-year-old more simply and more extensively than that before they invent the concept of a logarithm, and they've been hanging around adults talking bits and decibels already. Can you give me an example of a few numbers and their weird property values such that the weird property values obey that rule, says Keltham. How many powers of two fit in them? Okay, I give up. How the ass do wizards end up knowing about powers of two, but not about the function for how many powers of two something is? Sometimes the spell silver cost of an item grows by powers of two. I've never seen one that grows by the function for how many powers of two something is. All righty idy then. Though one observes that if there's a function from how powerful is this magic item to how much money does this cost me, there is generally some reverse function that goes from how much money do I have available to spend to how powerful of a magic item can I get. Anyways, I propose that what you want is a mysterious function with the following property. Whiteboarding. For any numbers x and y, the mysterious function of x times y equals the mysterious function of x plus the mysterious function of y. And again, can you make up some particular values for x and y and mysterious function values that obey this rule. X is 3 and has a score of 1. Y is 4 and has a score of 2. X times Y is 12 and has a score of 3. Doesn't work if X is 3 and Y is 3. Okay. X is 3, score 1. Y is 4, score 3. X times Y is 12, score 4. 
You're going to say that 81 should also have score 4 then. Okay, I'm not really seeing how to do it if it's not just powers of 2. I think we want to count part powers of 2 somehow, except I don't actually know how. Prediction, Asmodia says. Message to Keltham. If 2 is 1, 9 should be a little bit more than 3, since 8 is 3, so 3 should be a little more than 1 and a half. Should I tell them that? You're good to repeat that. Asmodia repeats it. Keltham writes it down. Score of 2 equals 1. Score of 8 equals 3. Score of 9 equals 3 plus a tad. Score of 3 equals 1 half times score of 9. So what they need is a rule for the leftovers. After you take out the powers of 2, which behaves the same way as the bigger, take out the powers of 2, rule. Can you take out powers of something smaller? No, that doesn't feel like it'd work. It treats the places where numbers are whole as different. The real answer won't do that. Can you dot 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 define how close, in a multiplying way, the bit left over is to being another power of two? Keltham will write some more questions. Asmodia, give them two minutes and then you're allowed to start telling them. Score of two equals one. Score of one equals question mark. Score of one half equals question mark. Score of one fourth equals question mark. Score of two thirds is approximately question mark. Score of 99 over 100 is approximately question mark. Score of zero equals question mark. Asmodia will take out her own spell timer pocket watch and deliberately start looking at it. Yes, the new puzzles on the board do precisely crystallize the question. They just don't suggest how you answer it. But if Asmodia figured it out already, then it can't be that hard. What does it mean to find the one halfth power of two? Well, presumably it's the number that multiplied by itself makes two. What does it mean to find the 99 over 100th power of two? Okay, I think it just works to have fractional powers of two, she says. So you can use the powers of two rule all the way through. Ioni has that score, one is zero, and score one half is minus one. Merit Cell yells that score, one quarter, is minus two, before Ioni can finish her next sentence. Time's up. Score of two-thirds is half of score of four-ninths, which will be a bit less than score of one-half. So a bit more, uh, a bit less than negative one-half. Score of two-thirds equals a bit less than negative one-half. Score of 99 over 100 is a bit less than zero, and she's not sure about score of zero. She keeps wanting to think score of zero equals zero, but score of one is already zero. Most of the rest of the class is not going to get logarithms with three minutes of discussion and is writing down the answers while somewhat lost. Okay. So in Dothilon, everybody in this class would have been sorted here out of thousands of candidates, based on really fine-grained predictions that caused everybody to finish getting the problem within roughly the same minute. In broken Cheliac schools for people with average intelligence 10, Everybody who falls slightly behind is left to sit in total confusion for the rest of the class while effort gets focused on the people who are ahead. Am I missing something there that is more clever than it sounds? If it's not always the same people who are ahead, we're going to end up with a class no one member of which has all of the pieces. Fully thirty seconds of thinking about this on my own part has so far failed to yield a brilliant solution. Mostly it's the left to sit in total confusion for the rest of class thing says Pela. Yeah, so what about not that? How many rats' cunnings do we have available to tap people with? We mostly didn't prepare spells this morning, says Gregoria. We got introduced to the High Priestess and then went to breakfast and then, uh, watched Carissa prepare fourth circle spells. Sorry, not sorry. Twelve minus Carissa Asmodia Meritzel Ioni equals eight. Security. I don't suppose there's eight rats' cunning spells going spare around here. Security consults each other via raised eyebrows. We have three of Fox's cunning, one of them says after a pause. All right, this is not going to be the last time we run into this issue while we wait on intelligence headbands for the class. And even then, if I've got this right, they'll just be plus two headbands. So here's my baseline policy proposal to meliorize, improve from there. This time I spend extra time tutoring everyone who isn't Carissa Asmodia Marichal and Iona on logarithmic functions. I see how much further we can get based on that, 
Then we take a longer lunch break than usual, so everyone can prep spells, and in particular prep the crap out of Fox's cunning. If there's second circle spells you'd usually want to have, and won't be getting because of this policy, and there's spells a cleric can cast for you, maybe tell me and I'll start praying for those. Security. I'm not sure what kind of collective resources all the wizards at this installation have in the way of second circle spells, but I request at least sixteen foxes' cunnings available for us to allocate on future days. Thirty-two would be better. Civilization sometimes sorts people having difficulties to easier classes, which will, of course, exist, and be optimized for that purpose to the limit of what very smart people can manage. It doesn't leave them sitting confused. There's a saying about cryopreservation, which is civilization doesn't leave anyone behind. It's sort of a good saying, so Keltham's not saying it in Cheliax, but the thought did run through his mind. I'll report that and we can see what we can do. But we only get personal use spells once all the emergency response needs of the installation are met, and I don't know if it'll add up to 32. Obviously implicit to a Chelish listener, and you're commandeering all our personal use spells, you know. This particular subtext is also very legible to Abadar clerics, who are not famous for expecting free services that nobody has to pay for. I could be wrong, having not tried it either way, let alone both ways, but being able to brute force bottlenecks like that and keep the class unified seems like the sort of thing that could easily correspond to a factor of 1.5 speed difference in our work. The work that is, in fact, the reason this installation exists in the first place. I submit a request for, temporarily, until intelligence headbands arrive, stationing additional wizards here, second circle or higher, collectively able to supply sixteen foxes cunning per day, or to make up deficits in emergency response capabilities produced by reallocating the second circle spells of those wizards who possess adequate security clearance to be in direct contact with us. 32 is better. If that can't happen by tomorrow, I request at least 12 foxes' cunnings that day, collectively among available security wizards. If I had an actual budget, I would be asking how much it cost inside that budget to compensate you for any time or inconvenience, or hire those additional wizards. But having an actual budget with line items is not a way that governance seems to currently be trying to relate to me, and so I can only ask governance for stuff. I'll submit that to the site manager. He heads out. Should the four of us go to the library and talk among each other while you cover the rest of the class? Or should we stay? Outside view on the way similar events have previously played out for us predicts that I'll say 15 different things. I wish you'd been present to hear. Indeed. She sits at her desk and puzzles over what the score for zero is. Dathalani kids before they run into logarithms, have prior experience with seeing numbers as bags of prime factors. Maybe running over that for a few minutes will help with priming this pump. Fifteen is a bag of a three and a five. Four is a bag of two twos. Fifteen times four equals sixty, so sixty is a bag of two twos, a three, and a five. If you multiply two and three, you get six. So, if you divide sixty by six, you should get a bag of one two and a five. Two times five is ten. Checks out, right? Now make up your own bags with numbers and play with that to see if your reasoning by bags of factors gets you the right answer. Well, sure, you can use fours as factors and see what happens. But if you want to turn numbers into unique bags of numbers, each number in the bag has to not be made up of any numbers smaller than itself. This the students can follow along with. The application to creating a scoring rule is not clear. Does it help if he mentions that a bag of 1.584962s is almost exactly three? How would you possibly figure that out if you didn't know it, though? Did anybody happen to learn calculus since Keltham mentioned they should do that? Yep. It was one of the major things they did while Keltham was at the Imperial Palace, along with triage on the library. They didn't get very far, since that was only one day and they didn't have textbooks or anything. That's weird. He'd expect significant progress on calculus if you were spending a significant part of a day on it. How were they studying calculus at all without textbooks? Tutoring from somebody? Some of security knew some and were willing to trade favors once they were back alive. Those favors need to be charged to the project budget somehow. Onward, then. 
they're going to need calculus anyways to get all the way through proving that the logarithmic scoring rule works correctly, and the calculus you need for that exact thing shouldn't be hard to teach in a few minutes, even if Keltham has to do it from scratch. But let's keep the focus on logarithms for now. So first of all, remember that Asmodia had already worked out that since 9 is a bit more than 8, there should be slightly over 3 2s inside a bag of 2 3s. So, 1.584962s inside a bag of 1 3 shouldn't be surprising. And is that one fact Asmodia found going to be the only fact like that which exists? 3 3s is 27, and 2 5s is 25. So there should be slightly less 2s in a bag of 2 5s than in a bag of 3 three 3s. Say there's a thrice bit more than 4.52s in a bag of 3 three 3s, then a little fewer 2s in a bag of 2 5s, so there ought to maybe be 4.52s in a bag of 2 5s, and 2.252s in a bag of 1 5. The actual number is 2.32193 or so, which is, as one would expect, a tad more 2s than are in a 4. You could also notice that a bag of 7 twos is 128, and a bag of 3 fives is 125, so you'd expect a tad less than 7 thirds twos in 1 5, which would give you an estimate of 2.333 twos per 5. Not far off at all, right? Yes, Keltham is writing this down on the whiteboard. 3 times 3 times 3 equals 27 corresponds to log base 3 of 27 equals 3. 5 times 5 equals 25 corresponds to log base 5 of 25 equals 2. 2 times log base 2 of 5 equals log base 2 of 25 is approximately equal to log base 2 of 27 equals 3 times log base 2 of 3. 3 times log base 2 of 2 equals 3 is approximately equal to log base 2 of 9 equals 2 times log base 3 of 3. Log base 2 of 3 is approximately 1.5. Actually, log base 2 of 3 is approximately 1.58496. 2 times. Log base. 2 of 5 is approximately 3 times 1.5 equals 4.5. Log base 2 of 5 is approximately 2.25. Log base 2 of 125 equals 3 times log base 2 of 5 is approximately equal to log base 2 of 128 equals 7. Log base 2 of 5 is approximately 7 thirds equals 2.333. Actually, log base 2 of 5 is approximately 2.32193. Now there's cleverer ways to compute this once you actually get calculus. But it so happens that 3 to the power of 12 equals 531,441 and that 2 to the power of 19 equals 524,288. There's slightly more than 19 twos in a bag of 12 threes, so you'd expect log base 2 of 3 to even more precisely be a tad more than 19 twelfths, which will be 1 twelfth more than 1.5, so 1.58333, which is nicely closer to the true 1.58496 than the previous estimate of 1.5 problem time. If you happen to have memorized the figure of 1.584962s per 3, you could derive that log base 2 of 8 ninths is approximately negative 0 0.08496 times 2, for purposes of scoring a prediction of 8 ninths on something that actually happened. So, score of 8 ninths is about negative 0.17 bits, to borrow the baseline term. Does anybody see how that figure gets derived? There's a lot of silent scribbling. Well, says Gregoria after a bit, log base 2 of 8 over 9 is log base 2 of 8 plus log base 2 of 1 over 9. That's the entire desirable scoring property that got them on this horrible tangent in the first place. And log base 2 of 8 is 3. And log base 2 of 1 over 9 is going to be negative, fractions always are. Log base 2 of 1 over 2 was negative 1. Log base 2 of 1 over 4 was negative 2. Log base 2 of 1 over 8 is going to be negative 3. And log base 2 of 1 over 9 is going to be negative log base 2 of 9. She doesn't actually know why this works, but she can see that 3 minus 1.58496 times 2 is about negative 0.17. Sure. 
It's just saying that you have to take around 0.172s out of a 9 in order to get an 8. 9 times 8 ninths equals 8. 3.172s minus 0.172s equals 3 twos, so an 8. 8 ninths just literally means the number you multiply 9 by in order to get 8, so it's the number you multiply by to take 0.172s out of the bag. If it's a probability of something happening 8 times out of 9, it's the same number and will score the same way, according to the scoring rule that counts 2s in things, which is the scoring rule that gives you the same cumulative score whether you assign 1 fourth to 2 events or 1 sixteenth to their product event. That's message. If you don't actually understand it, don't act like you do. I don't understand why taking 0 0.17 of a 2 out of a bag of 2s is a thing you're allowed to do, says Pela. Well, look at it this way. A 16 is a bag of 2 4s. What happens if you take half a 4 out of the bag? You take a 2 out, and now you've got a bag that multiplies up to 8. A million is a bag of 2,000s. What happens if you take a third of a 1,000 out of the bag? I don't know what a third of a 1,000 is. I mean, I know what it is when it's 333. But it's not here. A thousand is a bag of three tens. What happens if you take a third of three tens out of a bag of twice three tens? You have five tens left in the bag. So, a hundred thousand? Yep. His smile goes away after a moment. It's impossible to have any sense of how well this is going when everybody is supposed to learn this at age five or six and they're adults. Well, if you can take half of a four out of a bag of fours and a third of a thousand out of a bag of thousands, why not take seventeen one hundred thes of a two out of a bag of twos? I guess. I mean, there's the problem of figuring out that taking out zero point one seven twos from a bag works out to multiplying the contents by roughly eight over nine. But you can get that fairly precisely off nineteen twos being a bit less than twelve threes. Possible self-study problem. Rederive that yourself, convince yourself of it, prove it, without looking back at the whiteboard. Now, or after class? How many people in this group think that's now so obvious that there's no point in proving it themselves? Because if the answer is no, then yeah, maybe everybody pauses and tries to rederive the logic. Most of them don't, in fact, find it so obvious there's no point in proving it. They get to work on that. This would otherwise be a good time to message Carissa to ask how he's doing, teaching-wise, but apparently Asmodia, Ioni, Meritzel, and Carissa also think that redereaving this claim is a good exercise for them to do. Possibly Keltham is overcorrecting for how many fewer exercises ought to be required to grok logarithms if you first encounter them as an adult, rather than a five-year-old. When Carissa was a five-year-old, she required one-on-one -on -one tutoring from her mother to have enough attention for anything at all complicated, constantly forgot things that ought to be in working memory and needed reminding of them, and had about ten minutes' attention span for actual thinking. Trying to teach her math in a group would have been a disaster. Anyway, what is eight nine this as a bag of twos? Davilan didn't say it was easy to teach it to five-year-olds. Civilization is staring at that problem and optimizing it roughly as hard as civilization ever optimizes anything. Figuring out how to have logarithms be fun to learn about starting one month earlier, on maturation timelines, is a perfectly respectable accomplishment for a plus four SD researcher's entire life's work. If any single individual made a discovery like that single-handedly, it would get them well into the more money than one person can reasonably spend on themselves category of rich. Meritzel scribbles until satisfied that the logarithm of 8 over 9 is going to be the difference between the logarithm of 8 and the logarithm of 9, and then until satisfied that that difference is the difference between 3 and 2 times the logarithm of 3, and then looks around for someone who looks stuck and helpfully helps. Paxty, are you stuck? Paxty has worked out that 8 over 9 is 0 0.888. She's worked out that 19 twos is 524,288. By multiplying by 8 repeatedly to get to 18 twos, and then doubling the final result, which got her an answer that could have maybe been on the whiteboard she can't look at. Paxty is currently working on computing 12 threes via assembling a bag of six nines, 
After that, she's going to divide out 19 over 12 the long way. Maybe if she computes all the numbers Keltham said to compute, it'll be obvious, once she's computed them, how to put them together. Message. Hey, free hint. All of that's stupid. Further hints available for sale. Message. Keltham wandered over to look at what I was doing and nodded approvingly. Fuck off. A bit later on, Paxty has managed to get 9 to the power of 6 equals 531,603. Close enough. And 19 over 12 equals 1.58 something. Now she just has to figure out how that all fits together with 8 over 9. Or 3 twos and 2 threes, 19 twos equals 12 threes. You need more twos than threes to make up something, so that makes sense. 19 over 12 is the number of twos in a three. There'll be two times 19 over 12 twos in a nine, so it's two times 19 over 12 equals 19 over six. Subtract three twos for the eight, and 19 over six minus three equals 19 over six minus 18 over six equals message Keltham. I get that there's exactly one-sixth of a two in an eight over nine. Does that make any sense? Keltham will come over and check how she arrived at that conclusion, but will soon approvingly inform Paxty that if, as is not actually the case, two to the power of nineteen exactly equaled three to the power of twelve, then yes, there'd be exactly negative one-sixth twos in eight-ninths. Please observe that negative one-sixth is negative point one six six six, or about negative point one seven. To try to see it at a glance, Consider that if there's nineteen twelfths of a two, in one three, that's one twelfth more of a two, than one and a half twos. Nineteen twelfths equals eighteen twelfths plus one twelfth. So in a nine, there should be two twelfths more twos than an eight. Though it's actually a bit more, because three to the power of twelve is greater than two to the power of nineteen, so there's a bit more than nineteen twelfths twos in a three. It might be good to give everyone another similar problem, Carissa tells Keltham, to check if they really get it. 3-5-S is a tad less than 7-2-S. Tell me how to score a prediction of two-fifths on something that actually happens. Sanity check. 2-5 is a noticeable chunk less than 1-2, so your score should be a noticeable chunk less than minus 1-2-S. If you're a worshipper of Lord Nethys, you can by this point work out in your head that the answer is 4-3 and then write it down on the paper without any visible work accompanying it. Two-fifths is log base two of two minus log base two of five, so that'll be one minus something a little greater than two. If there were seven twos in three fives, then there'd be seven-thirds of a two in a five, so it'd be one minus seven-thirds. Everyone is mostly keeping up now, though at obviously varying speeds. Well, obviously this learning experience is done then. At least Keltham figures that's how it should work, if you don't need to just spend a bunch of time playing around waiting for your brain to mature slightly further. They should probably all stand up and walk around and eat a tiny snack, though. Pilar has some appropriately tiny snacks in her bag. Caden Kaelian apparently has nothing better to do with the power he received from the Starstone and all his worshippers. Sure, snacks. Even if they're from Caden Kaelian and therefore kind of weird. This may be a dumb question, but is there any connection, however distant, between the snacks and the Elysium thing? Keltham previously knew two facts about Pilar, her trip and her fetish, and he was already suspecting there would ultimately prove to be some connection between them, trope-wise, not causally. Now he has noticed a third fact repeated twice. Pilar has candy. Can Pilar be placed in my telepathic bond, please, and this fact concealed? Yes, almost definitely. They're both the product of some intervention by Caden Kailan, which we think is in support of the project, but we're not entirely sure, honestly. Almost definitely, yes. Um, according to what was found out yesterday, the snacks are a product of an intervention by Caden Kailan, which people seem to think is in support of the project, and Caden Kailan is chaotic good, which is the alignment on Elysium, but nobody's sure about anything. Wait, so a god intervened to support our project with tiny snacks? That would be very stupid, which is why Cheliax's very smart people are confused. Some possibilities. It's actually stupid. 
Kylian is called the drunk god, etc., etc. Pilar can fill that in with true stuff. Alternatively, it's meant as a form of communicating that chaotic good is backing Asmodeus here. Alternatively, it'll turn out to actually be important for some reason, say if the project is besieged, or if everyone is nutrient deficient on something that the snacks contain. Alternatively, there's some kind of pre-existing god agreement which happened to cash out like this. Repeating back some things that have been said to me, that would, in fact, be incredibly stupid. The phrase fucking chaotic fucking good does come to mind. Caden Kalian is called the drunk god because he did the star stone on a dare while drunk. But it could also be to show that chaotic good is backing Asmodeus on this. Or it could be important for some reason, like we get besieged and have to survive on my snacks. Or everyone ends up deficient in something the snacks contain. Or there could be a pre-existing god agreement that happens to imply this. Could you maybe have mentioned this earlier? Could you maybe have mentioned this before handing out the snacks? Seems to demand a fast response. There literally hasn't been time since I saw you at breakfast. This probably seems even weirder if you're not from Galarian, doesn't it? It actually does, and I would in fact like to be told about all divine interventions on my project as soon as they become known to governance moving forwards. Are there any more? I just know about Asmodeus on the project twice, Nethys on Ioni, and Caden Kalian on me. Uh, sorry? I think you sort of expect me to know what you've already been told, and I don't, actually. Is everything on Galarian this poorly organized from a management perspective? We wouldn't know because we don't have magic items that connect us to all of the knowledge in the world. Wizard School, which I've been to, was better organized, but it wasn't, uh, it hadn't started existing less than a week ago. Thinking loudly, Dear Asmodeans, have you considered actually telling Keltham some things before he finds them out and asks why he hasn't been told them? Well, they did tell Keltham that Pilar was held up in the capital by tons of very serious people trying to figure out what the fuck was going on with her, which is about as much set up for we're not keeping this secret on purpose as you can manage. Probably the payoff to things like that needs to always be a couple hours later. Security, pull him aside. Keltham, can we talk privately for a minute? Of course, security. Privacy spell. All divine interventions on the project disclosed to us are as follows. Asmodeus, at the world wound the first day, communicating to his priests that the project should be established. The next is the intervention of Broom's god, Otolmans, the lawful neutral god of preventing catastrophes, empowering Broom. We now believe that Caden Kalian's manipulation of Pilar began on the third day, when she mysteriously ended up in the room with you before your excursion out of the villa, and that its primary aim at least was saving your life, but we haven't ruled out that it began on the second day, because Pilar didn't recall that incident as unusual until we asked about it, and anything where she mysteriously ended up somewhere other than in a secure operation she hadn't been invited to might have been hard to detect in retrospect. We think Pilar went to Elysium as a consequence of it somehow. As I think was reported to you, she spent yesterday at the palace with people trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. But we are still a ways away from a satisfactory answer, though the snacks have been very conclusively demonstrated non-magical, safe, and tasty. Nidal's attack on you was almost certainly a divine intervention. Ione's warning was a divine intervention. A second divine intervention by Asmodeus directed us to restart the project here. That is the specific answer to your specific question, but it occurs to me that you might additionally want to receive the briefing we all receive daily, which is more extensive than that. Carissa is giving these instructions. I would definitely like to receive at least one of those briefings, and if possible, review previous ones. I think I can already guess the answer to this, but if I ask the question, what official of Chelish governance has responsibility for making sure Keltham learns things we know, and that he'd obviously want to know? Is there in fact no such identifiable official who gets pointed questions from their boss when something like this happens? Split-second decision— is it a good idea to make governance sound that incompetent? Taldor would be. Cheliax obviously isn't. What happened is that it was Carissa's call and Carissa who will get, ha, huh, pointed questions from her superiors about it, and arguably also mail all on the grounds that everyone knew Carissa wasn't at full capacity and it was his job to be handling communications with Keltham in the meantime. 
Incompetence is an easier lie than most other lies to tell, and they are going to need to escape later. They couldn't escape from the real Cheliacs. I don't know if that's anybody's specific job, Carissa has security say. It very well might be that there is, but they got pulled to the front with Nadal. This is a really unusual situation for our procedures. If you want to ask that question of the site director, they definitely know exactly what went wrong. Question 1. Why wasn't I immediately told that Broom was from a goddess named Otolmans? Why is that information secret, and who here can I talk about it with? Question 2. I realize this wasn't your own decision, but for purposes of concretely understanding Chelish governance, I file a request for, possibly later, an example trace of the process that led to my, apparently, being approved to know the name of Broom's goddess, and this approval being known to you, but nobody actually telling it to me. Was there a pending briefing, or is it that you have a process for approving me, but not a process for actually telling me what is going on? It sounds like I maybe have to acquire some domain expertise on what is going on. Does this project in fact have a budget, or are people in governance just doing things? Question 3. Does anything else spring to mind that nobody specifically has the ball on telling me about, even though I ought to be allowed to know it? Because let me say right now, I've already noticed one thing like that, and have been quietly, and in some bemusement and concern, pretending not to notice, while I wait to see if it's being hidden on purpose for an interesting reason. O'Tolman's name is secret. You can talk about it with Broom, you can talk about it with security, you can talk about it with the site manager. You can request clearance for specific students, if you want to be able to talk about it with them. The reason O'Tolman's name is secret is secret, and I do not know it, nor whether you're cleared to know it. I don't know how you got cleared to learn O'Tolman's name, but I can request an example trace of the process. I learned that you were cleared to know that this morning, at our briefing and not at our evening briefing last night, so the clearance almost certainly arrived in that time frame. I do not know the project budget. I don't know which things you've been told. But I'm assuming you're more likely to not have been briefed on things that happened since the war started. Uh, since the war started, they found some ancient skeletons in the villa while they were searching it for Kuthite traps. The skeletons weren't Kuthite traps, to be clear, just someone had died there some decades or centuries ago. We've withdrawn teleport-capable casters from the world wound temporarily, with other nations filling in for us and added a bunch of them here. There was a supply run to Absalom. We raised all of the project staff who died. We instituted a mandate that all Project Security carry scrolls of teleport. The girls who hadn't made afterlife arrangements did so. There was discussion of finding some perfectly normal INT-10 peasants to be on cooking staff at the project, in case you find it useful to talk to an average person. Item I was thinking of wasn't on that list. I'll let it keep and see what happens. My apologies if I sounded a bit sharp in your personal presence. I am not under the impression that, whichever security you are, is personally responsible for my travails here. I request Otolman's clearance for Carissa Saver. We done for now? That's all I know, though I can ask the site director to immediately deliver whatever briefing they were planning to get around to this evening or whenever. If a schedule exists, then I am not perturbed by it happening in the evening, provided that there are no pending items in it on the order of divine interventions. Actually, further item if it won't drop memory, and if it will, let's get paper. I request, rather urgently at this point, the nearest thing that can be found to a book which lists out all the known gods, large enough or local enough or domain-relevant enough to be looking at my project, one which would include every mentioned god so far except Otolmans, and a book that will cover in it somewhere what is known about agreements between gods. This information is apparently highly relevant in practice to my project, on what has so far been a daily basis. I'll pass that along as urgent. Keltham stalks back into his lecture room. I don't know why I expected planetary average intelligence 10 management processes and bureaucratic design principles to successfully be only slightly beneath Doth Elani standards, but in fact, they're not, Keltham says. I am restraining myself from interrupting the math we were in the middle of doing, for that digression. We should finish the math first. After that, or shortly later... I am going to deliver a really pointed lecture on lawful organizational principles whose pointedness is not, in fact, aimed at you, but is aimed at whoever ends up reading it. Sounds really interesting. Keltham takes a moment to compose himself. Keltham takes an additional moment to compose himself. 
If Chelish governance is running some kind of massive effort to gaslight him, they sure are doing a good job of including the appearance of not being competent enough to pull that off, and making lots of weird errors about information that isn't really being concealed, but nobody is bothering to tell him, serving as a cover for whatever it is that's actually being hidden. Which, you know, is what you'd expect from competent governance running a competent gaslighting operation, right? No doubt the average thinkoomph on this planet is not really... 3SD? That's ridiculous. How would people even survive? Look at how long it took them to find or train an actor who could convincingly pose as Intelligence 10 while doing kitchen work. Math. He was supposed to be teaching math. Okay, you know what? I am not actually going to be able to focus on math until I get this out of my system. We're just going to put everything about logarithms and bags of factors of two and prediction scoring rules on hold to be resumed later. Instead, I'm going to deliver a talk that had better be transcribed and delivered accurately to everyone who is trying to manage Project Lawful. Project Lawful is a terrible name, by the way. The moment I heard it, I knew that the decision-making processes behind it were going to be correspondingly terrible. I wasn't going to say this until after I'd covered the concepts of probabilistic updating, probabilistic entanglement, and mutual information those being the law which would allow me to explain exactly why this was a terrible idea. But absent that law, consider an adversary pondering two alternative hypotheses based on evidence they've managed to collect. One theory is that a certain Chelish project is investigating a mysterious source of knowledge not previously existent in Galarian. One theory is that Cheliax is making a massive effort to scale up metalworking because they expect to be invaded. If you give your projects cool names, one of these possibilities will sound much more than the other, like something that someone might have called Project Lawful, even if they can't deduce the true answer just from the name. You should call your amazing top-secret project Project Doorknob, or something else chosen completely at random by a true randomness source, which carries no information whatsoever about what the project actually does. Except, of course that if all your other top-secret projects also have cool names, the one with a sane name will stand out as being the only one with any sane thinker in it, meaning, someone not from Galarian, if anybody like Lirilatha knows what that should look like, so this should be Project Dragon, maybe. The password to the forbiddance on the previous project site is also terrible and completely insecure, and whoever said it should never be allowed to invent any passwords again and if you're thinking that I'm an idiot for not thinking to mention that before they set the password here, you're right. For the record, a slightly better password for a forbiddance might be, for example, Escape Copper Shore. It's not hard to remember, but difficult for an adversary to guess unless they get a quite large number of tries. But I digress. Basic Project Management Principles An Angry Rant by Keltham of Doth Elan Section 1 how to have anybody having responsibility for anything. Frustrated but not suspicious is a good thing. Possibly the best outcome, aside from Carissa having been good at her job and that ship has left the harbor, so to speak. Nonetheless, this is possibly worse than being lit on fire. Meritzel does not look over at Carissa at all because she remembers being told by security that she can have Sevar's job if she's better at it, but that if she achieves that by sabotaging Sevar, then she can't. Well, actually, she was threatened with a horrible death, to be specific. If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash askwhocastsai. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059.